So now, what else happens when we're stressed? Well, in the field of psychoneuroimmunology, we've been studying for by 30 plus years, the impact that the stress has on immune function, our defenses, our resistance against disease. But I want to spend just a few minutes kind of hopefully making you a more critical consumer of this research literature. That is, if you have any propensity at all to look at some of these studies, you got to realize a few things. First of all, we have mastered the art of immunosuppression. We can have you come into our lab in every which way we can stress you out and compromise your immune response. Okay? But that really has done very little to understand how do we actually enhance your immune system. Right? Certainly, of a person who has a healthy functioning immune system, how do we enhance it? We know very, very, very little. Now, that doesn't stop different companies from promoting, oh, this boosts your immunity, right? And that's really one way to get it under the skin of a uh, psychoneuroimmunologic uh, researcher. But we really, just because we know how to minimize the kind of uh, damage done, does not necessarily translate into how do we increase functioning of an already uh, well-functioning system. There's also been an extreme bias in the subjects that we have selected to be in these studies. In fact, it was true through the 19, most of the 1990s that 90% of subjects in these studies were all college-educated white men under the age of 22. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to generalize a lot from that population, right? Does that truly help us understand how this affects the immune functioning of women in their 40s? No. Men in their 70s? No. People with autoimmune disorders, lupus, MS? No. Teenagers? No. Well, the reason why there was such a bias is because kind of what I refer to as simplistic science. That is, we always take one group and compare them to another. We stress you out and don't stress you out. Or you have some characteristic and you don't and we want to look at differences in immune function. Well, my experience in reading of the literature is that it's, in the, it's the immune system that differs most between one person and the next. So the person sitting next to you is probably relatively similar to you in terms of neuromuscular and cardiovascular functioning. But in terms of immune functioning, we have no clue. So we want, we want to minimize the uh, within group variants. You take people as homogenous as possible to maximize a chance that you see a difference when you compare these two groups. Well, one way you do that is eliminate women. Okay, well, that changed, fortunately, with laws and policies in the mid-1990s. But do you know why we just kind of conveniently excluded women from these studies? Because if you don't know by now, researchers are kind of a controlling bunch. And if there's one thing that affects your immune system that we have so little control over, ladies, it's that menstrual cycle of yours, right? So just kind of excluded you. So again, fortunately, in the mid-90s with laws and regulations, that changed. But that's very important to understand who are the subjects in this study. You've got to really kind of think about this. And finally, the focus has been on singular outcomes. Now, here at Ohio State, you are living amongst the mecca of psychoneuroimmunologic research. Jan Kiekel, Glazer, Ron Glazer, and their team, they did do some of the best work on the, on the planet, uh, looking at the impact of stress on immune function. But they generally are gonna focus on, let's say, immunoglobulin response. You go over to Yale, you're looking at the impact of stress on natural killer cell activity. You go over to UC San Francisco, you're looking at lymphocyte proliferation. You go down to the University of Miami, all of these are kind of well-respected hubs of this kind of work. Michael Antoni, Neil Schneiderman down in Miami, they're maybe looking more at T helper suppressor ratios. Well, the reason why that's done that way is because people really want to know how their kind of corner of the immune system responds under different conditions, and then they vary the conditions. But what that unfortunately doesn't help us understand is maybe there's all these you know, regulatory, self-regulating mechanisms going on, and you can see a suppression in lymphocytes, but maybe you see an elevation in natural killer cells, compensating in that way. And so clinical outcomes, those are relatively rare. So there's a, 
there's kind of a pretty big disconnect between the research community, or there has been historically, and the clinical community, those of us who are trying to help our patients, and the patients themselves. Now, with all those limitations, what can I stand up here and responsibly tell you is true from a research perspective and actually matters clinically? Control is king. That is, if there is one reliable way to change immune function, it's to make a person feel out of control. They either lose control or they just continuously lack control in the situation. That is the most often studied, most consistent finding for over 25 years. No control, bad outcomes, immunologically speaking, until just about five or six years ago, when in fact, a total reversal. Now, people, not all the time, but often when they're put in uncontrollable situations, show an enhanced immune response. What happened just seven or eight years ago I'll share with you in a minute. But control, absolutely, is key and it will change immune function. Second most often studied psychological phenomenon and its impact on immune functioning is expressing our feelings, emotional expression. Now raise your hand if you've ever even heard of James Pennybaker and the diary keeping studies. Not many at all. If you're in the field of mental health, I will tell you that in my Humble opinion, this guy has probably done more in, in creating evidence showing that what we do in mental behavioral health improves physical functioning and, and people's health than any psychologist, any clinical psychologist I know of. Now, he's a social psychologist, and he, as story will have it, was talking to therapists, and he said, in disbelief, you're kidding me. Talking about your feelings, you think, has health benefits. So he set out to actually prove them wrong. Now you can be critical of how he tried to simulate the therapeutic cathartic experience, but his paradigm, and now I'm summarizing more than 80 studies done over the years, is people will come in and they're asked for 30 minutes to write, like in a diary, about a traumatic, highly stressful event that happened to them personally, somewhere in the past, and then go home come back the next day and write again for 30 minutes about that same stressful event and then go home and do this four days in a row. Now, <clears throat> they will most often have people write for 30 minutes. Um, sometimes they'll talk into a tape recorder. Most of the times it'll be 30 minutes uh, once a day, four days in a row. Sometimes once a week, four weeks in a row. But they're always compared to a comparison group that are doing the same things for 30 minute sessions, writing or speaking. But they're talking about non-stressful things, like you know, describe your kitchen cover or something. At the end of the fourth session, which group shows the negative outcomes? It's actually the disclosure group. They're reporting more negative affect, less positive affect, Immunologically, when there's a difference that soon, it's the disclosure group that's doing worse than the comparison group. And, in fact, especially if you do once a week, four weeks in a row, by the end of that fourth week, the disclosure group is saying, you know, I feel kind of achy. I feel more tired and fatigued. I don't feel so hot. The same is found. Now, they've done those four sessions. They are never asked to do that ever again. One month later and three months later, the same thing is found. The disclosure group is worse off. Until the studies, and most of the studies will follow people six months out, many even 12 months later, what do you find but a reversal of fortune? That is now the disclosure group relative to the comparison group are actually reporting more positive affect, less negative affect, immunologically across most measures, they're doing better than the comparison group, sometimes even better when they themselves started the study. And they're going to the doctor less often, they're taking fewer over-the-counter remedies, reporting fewer colds and flus. So, but what's interesting is that over the course of time, one of the uh, things that we saw, there was what we call a large fan effect, 
a fan effect is when some people would go through this emotional disclosure and they wouldn't benefit at all. Some people moderately so, some people a whole bunch. So the studies then try to pursue what is it about uh, people who benefit? What are some of the common factors? And uh, Margaret Kemeny, uh, very noted, well, uh, well respected psychoneuroimmunologist, paired up with Gordon Bauer when she was at UCLA. Uh, she's at UC San Francisco now. Um, and uh, Dr. Fozzi um, down at uh, UC Irvine. And the classic initial study was done on people with HIV. It's been replicated in various ways since. But what they did was they, they took people HIV positive. Every single subject had actually lost their partner, had died in the prior six months due to AIDS. There was no comparison group. They asked these people for four sessions to write about the death of their partner. And all they did was a logistic regression trying to predict who benefits a lot as measured by you know, viral load and T cell counts, and who didn't benefit really at all. The three common elements of people who benefited, one, it was their first or it was a novel disclosure. People who had been talking about this with family or friends in the you know, ensuing uh, pre previous months uh, didn't benefit as much. But if they had held it kind of close to the vest and really had not thought or, or talked about this very much before, that was one element. Second thing is that they needed to have these disclosures, these diary entries, needed to be heartfelt. That is, people who just kind of narrated a story, you know, he said this, she did this, and then I did this other thing, they didn't benefit nearly as much as the people whose diary entries contained more affectively charged words. Literally, there's a positive correlation between the number of affectively loaded words in your diary entry and the immunologic benefit you derive down the road. Third, and probably the most important element of all, is people who benefited came to a, quote, new meaning of that event in the larger context of their life. They went through a process. That is, sessions one and two, they were writing things, oh, it was awful, it's a very dark period of time of my life, and so forth, wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But by sessions three and four, there was still, you know, that was awful, you know, terrible, and so forth. But then you started to get these phrases of, you know, that's funny. The more I think about it, I realized my three closest friends became my closest friends because they were there for me during that really rough period. Or, you know, that's interesting. As I think more about it, I mean, this is how I felt then, and this is how I feel and think about it now. But I... One of the things that gives my life meaning, if I, I'm much more passionate about educating the community about AIDS, AIDS awareness, preventing AIDS, and so forth. Or, that's interesting, my deceased partner uh, was very much into playing the steel guitar. I was never into playing an instrument. But last week, that's weird, I signed up for piano lessons. It's putting the event in the larger context of their life. It's not Pollyannish, oh, I. I'm glad that happened. But again, multiple perspective taking is a very, very key coping skill that shows up in this disclosure uh, literature. Now, so then over, the t over time we realize that there's this basic kind of temporal sensitivity um, response to this disclosure. Initially not good outcomes, but later on, yes indeed they're there. And then the controllability literature, 25 years, slam dunk, not being in control, kind of negative consequences. Until what changed six or seven years ago, but how we drew the subject's blood. That's the only thing that's different. In the old days, we would pay a nurse, and we would stress you out for 30 or 40 minutes, and then a nurse would run in, prep your arm, draw blood. We'd let you rest for five minutes, we then expose you to another 45 minutes of stress. We'd have the nurse afterwards, at the end of that stressor, run in, prep your arm, draw blood. Never realizing that not for all, but for some markers of immunologic response, the six to seven minutes it took that nurse to go in and draw your blood meant all the difference of what we were looking at. Now we place inline catheters in your arm and we can take blood like that. What do we see? 
sometimes there is actually an amino enhancement. Like with other systems of our body, it's trying to defend. That's the first thing, survival. But that on some of these markers of immunologic health, there's a very quick decline, if you will, a wearing out of that response, sometimes in a matter of minutes.